the beginning was the Big Bang. We are told that 13 to 20 billion years ago, everything that makes up the universe as we know it was spontaneously created out of nothing through an unimaginably violent explosion. But did it really happen as we are told? A growing number of astronomers doubt it and are showing why. This is their story, the story of the universe. The um, observational aspects of uh, trying to understand the universe, I think it's reasonable to start about a hundred years ago. And about a hundred years ago, almost everybody in astronomy without question assumed that the whole of the universe was what you could see in the Milky Way. Nobody felt they could, that the universe was any bigger than the, than the stars that you see in the sky associated with our own local Milky Way. And that was a situation certainly around 1905, times like that, there are well-known people who propounded these ideas. Ten years later, Einstein first proposed his general theory of relativity. Now, when Einstein proposed this, it's a theory of gravity, which means that it's a theory which should represent the whole of the universe because it's gravitational forces that are controlling the universe. Well, Einstein made this theory around 1915, and uh, he immediately wanted to try and use this theory to explain the universe as it then was, the so-called Milky Way system. But of course, the idea of this was that it was a static system. That is, it wasn't contracting or expanding. It was a static system. And Einstein found that his equations did not allow for a static universe unless he inserted a certain constant in the mathematics, which was, became known as the cosmological constant. But what happened in the early 1920s was that a very a clever Russian called Friedman in 1922 found solutions to Einstein's equations which allow the universe to either expand or contract. Now that was done in, in, the, in the Soviet Union uh, soon after the revolution, and nobody in the West knew about this, I think. But in 1927, a Belgian, a Belgian priest, the Abbe Lemaitre, as he later became, uh, also discovered these solutions. And uh, he uh, went to England and his work was uh, publicized in Cambridge and elsewhere, and the famous uh, English astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington and others got to know about this, and they immediately began to say, how can this apply to the current universe? Well, in the same period, in 1929, Hubble made what I still believe was the most important discovery in extragalactic astronomy in the last century, he showed that if you look at the, the, the spiral nebulae, the faint spiral nebulae, the shifts in their spectra are proportional to their apparent brightnesses. And this led very soon to the idea that this fitted very well with the expanding universe and that indeed uh, this is the kind of universe we lived in, that what we were looking at are our galaxies, Milky Ways, further and further away from us. And the further away from us, the larger the redshifts. And if that's interpreted in the way that most people would interpret it, this means that they are moving away faster and faster. So this was the original idea by the 1930s. The front page of the New York Times said, we live in an expanding universe. When Hubble made his great discovery, it was for galaxies like our own Milky Way galaxy. And they all followed the same rule, that the fainter they are, the larger their redshift. 
In other words, the faster they are moving away from us. This is known as the Hubble Law and directly led to the expanding universe theories. But in the 1960s, there was a new discovery, the quasi-stellar objects, often referred to as quasars. They appear as star-like points on the sky, frequently blue in color, and they have very, very large redshifts, implying that they are at huge distances from the Earth, at the very boundaries of the observable universe. Some astronomers soon found that a vast number of these strange new objects populated the regions around spiral galaxies and were not only observable with radio telescopes but were optical and x-ray sources as well. There were two properties of the quasars that were difficult for astronomers to understand using the expanding universe theory. The first was that if one plotted their apparent brightness against their redshifts, as one does for galaxies, one gets an unexpected scatter on the diagram, instead of the smooth curve made by the same plot done for galaxies. This seems to indicate that the quasars do not follow the Hubble law as do most other objects, and that there is no direct indication that they are actually at their proposed redshift distances. In fact, it is argued that if Hubble had first been given the plots for quasars, he and other astronomers would never have concluded that the universe was expanding. The second property was that quasars are very small, compact objects, sometimes only a light year across. So if quasars are really at their extreme redshift distances, they must then be the brightest and most energetic objects known to astronomers. So energetic, in fact, that untestable, almost metaphysical mechanisms must be applied to explain the phenomena. On the other hand, when placed at their observed distances, that is, in the neighborhood of nearby galaxies, their brightness and energies become normal, and no special mechanisms need to be evoked. This problem has led many astronomers to abandon the idea that all redshifts are due to their speed of recession away from the Earth. And if this is true, then there is no need for an expanding universe, and the Big Bang never happened. The questions arise. Is there a connection between certain types of galaxies and the quasar? Are quasars ejected from galaxies, and in fact proto-galaxies themselves? Is there some other astrophysical process which can explain the redshift discrepancies? One of the world's most controversial experts on the structure and morphology of quasars, Halton C. Arp, has for 35 years proposed just such an idea. For the heresy of opposing orthodox interpretations of the redshift problem, Arp has had to pay a heavy price, the same price paid by many a scientist with new and innovative ideas. Dr. Arp was forced to resign from his permanent position at the Carnegie Institute of Washington Observatories after the Caltech head of the Telescope Allocation Committee threatened him by saying, unless he changed his line of research, they would take away his telescope time. Due to this fact and his ongoing struggle against the established paradigms, Arp is often referred to as the modern Galileo. I remember when I sent the paper into... Uh the first paper into Astrophysical Journal uh, on, on the nature of companion galaxies, and I had a lot of them on the ends of spiral arms, and it was sure that they were connected, and I showed that they were systematically redshifted. I sent that in with, with, with naive, great expectations that people would be terribly interested and impressed on this, and the editor of the Astrophysical Journal at that time was Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who had a fantastic reputation as a, as a master theoretician and also quite an incomprehensible theoretician, and a, and a tremendously powerful uh, figure in the, in the field and editor of the Astrophysical Journal, which is probably the most powerful position in the field. And uh, he chose not to, in his wisdom and judicial fairness, chose not to send it to a referee, 
but he just wrote across the paper, this exceeds my imagination, and he sent it back to the director of my institute, Horace Babcock, with the obvious implication, you've got to do something about this, this uh, staff member of yours who's, who's doing these very bad things. And so Horace called me down in the office one day after this, and I walked in the, his office, into the director's office, and I saw this paper lying on, in front of him with Chandra Sekar's scrawl across it. And Horace looked at me and, and said, well, he said, this is just too, too much, and, and, and you're going to have to uh, uh, start looking for another job. And so all I could say to him was, well, if you send me that in writing, please send me in, in writing. And I was waiting in great trepidation for it for weeks and months to get something in writing and I finally never did so I realized that he decided to give me another chance so to speak. Uh, so that was fairly early in the game and then some years went by and there was the, the, the competition for time particularly on the 200 inch telescope was getting more and more heated and, and people were saying well we can't continue to give time to this obviously incorrect and embarrassing research that ARP does. So finally they sent uh, a letter to me from the allocation committee, including a number of the younger members of my, of my institute, saying that unless I changed my line of research, that they would have to take away my telescope time. At that point I considered the situation very carefully and I figured that the the evidence although a lot more evidence could be gathered and has since been gathered since then the important thing was not the evidence uh, because if it was true it would come out someday the important thing was the principle of scientific investigation whether people whether scientists could follow uh, new lines of investigation and follow up on, a, on, on evidence which apparently contradicted the current uh, theorems and the current paradigms. And I also felt that regardless of what happened to me personally, that this was the important issue and that, that I had no choice but to resign on the point of this issue so that if it developed, which I thought it would, that the, my line of investigation was correct, that people then within the future would say, okay, this was the wrong thing to do, and in the future, we're going to have to see that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. The observers come in now with the belief that we live in a Big Bang universe, and therefore all of their ways of understanding things are tailored to that. And they don't come in with the possibility that, that this, or that our alternative, or any other for that matter, is right and really do it in an open-minded way. And of course, what goes along with that is that observers who would like to test this way find it very hard to get observing time and so on. I mean, this relates to the whole issue of whether of the, 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 the complete lack of balance in the, in the way the observational programs and the funding are conducted. There's no question about that. I don't think that anybody would argue about it. Uh, I've always said that the cause of the troubles is the American Graduate School. You see, when we had graduated first, gra first degree, we were independent. We could uh, thumb our noses at the professor. And in fact, the best way to get ahead was to do something that the older people didn't agree with. Oh, really? You're right. That was the way to do it, and uh, but in in the graduate school, you all have to learn what you taught, what the professors are teaching mm -hmm. you, and then those people go out and get jobs, and they have a, another yeah. graduate, uh, their own graduate school, and it just uh, tier after tier. You get a few places like Caltech or like Harvard, and they set the fashion for every every place. I think there's a problem with graduate education. I think graduate education is not teaching students to think, to be independent researchers. I think it's teaching them to be part of a scientific society. 
and too much, especially students that are at the so-called elite institutions, I think they're taught too much the paradigm of their advisor. Uh, when I was director of the National Observatory 20 years ago, there was a very uh, well-known astronomer now, in fact she's just won the Cosmology Prize, so that's Vera Rubin. She was carrying out a program at Kitt Peak at the National Observatory of observing faint spiral galaxies with a view to looking to their redshift distribution, their velocity distribution. And um, this was a program that everybody thought was a good program. And so she'd been given observing time, and at the end of about a year, she had completed about a third of her program. And so she actually wrote a little paper pointing out that she was getting results very different from the ones that were expected. And um, we had our usual meeting, and when we got to her program, which was an ongoing program, so people just looked it over, the leading extragalactic astronomer on my committee of that day immediately said, well, look, she's getting this result. It doesn't fit. It has to be wrong. I recommend that we stop the program. That was his position. And it, what was interesting to me was I sat there and listened to this discussion. And the majority of the people, because of his, his level of knowledge and authority, went along with him. So the recommendation of the committee was that we stop the program. Well, I had the last word, so I ignored it. But most people don't. And the peer review system and NASA itself, which is very conformist, will always do just that. That's one of the reasons why the road ahead is hammered out. As Hoyle said, uh, anytime you point a new telescope at the sky now, you're only going to find what you already know is up there. I have, I have a lot of trouble with, with the academic world. Uh, the same as I do with the Bible Belt. It's the same kind of trouble. It's the same kind of trouble. It's because they get, they, they get a, a picture of this world which they are sure is right. Yes, yes. And they hang on to it for, mm -hmm. for all they're worth. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I often point out that I am probably more unorthodox than anyone who has ever burned at the stake. It's illegal now. <laughs> burning it's it. illegal now to burn somebody to the stake in your backyard. Peculiar Galaxy NGC 7603, discovered 30 years ago by Halton Arp, is one of the more striking examples of galaxy quasar connections. It has recently been re-examined after the discovery of two new quasar type objects embedded in the connecting filament. The renowned optical astronomer Margaret Burbage has for decades been a central figure in the struggle to bring controversial observations such as NGC 7603 to the attention of conventional astronomers. And for her fairness and untiring efforts in the field, she has become one of the most widely respected women in astronomy. There's a very interesting galaxy uh, known as NGC 7603. It has a, it's a Seifert galaxy, that means it has a, one of these active nuclei with strong emission lines and a lot of activity, obviously, going on in its center. And it was studied years ago by uh, Chip Arp in his um, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. It has a spiral arm that seems to come right outside of the galaxy, trailing right out, and it ends up on a, a, a fainter galaxy, but it ends right up uh, as, though it's, uh, as though it's connected connected the nuclei of, of the two galaxies. In this Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, which uh, published in 1966, uh, that was the point of the atlas, and one of the objects, just to, to illustrate uh, what a peculiar galaxy is, is this uh, what is now famous NGC 7603, and this is the central Seifert, which means just a very, very active galaxy with a lot of energy in the nucleus and uh, a lot of explosive energy and so forth. And uh, here is the high redshift companion here, and you see it's joined by a, a filament, a material. Uh, it turns out from the observations that this filament of material is material of the galaxy, gas and dust and stars and so forth. It's been drawn out in the ejection. 
But the astonishing thing, controversial matter, is that this galaxy is a much higher redshift than this. Now NGC 7603 has uh, uh, one redshift of um, about uh, 8,000 kilometers a second, and uh, the other galaxy has a much larger redshift. So how can they be connected? Well, this, this, these data were published uh, years ago, and everybody said, well, this is just a chance uh, location of, of a background galaxy near a, an interesting foreground galaxy. And that, that spiral arm has nothing to do with it. It's just a, the whole thing is just a chance. If you see two objects close together with very different redshifts, you only have one of two explanations. One is, that, as I say, that a large part of the redshift has nothing to do with distance. And the other is that it's an accident. So the real issue that you come down to is how frequently do you expect to see accidents? If you look carefully at the pictures that were taken of, of this field, you will notice two faint stellar objects that are in that spiral arm. Uh, one is close to NGC 7603, and uh, the other one is close to the, the faint uh, companion galaxy. In the year 2001, when the two young Spanish astronomers worked on this in the, 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 the uh, uh, Las Palmas telescope, uh, they f saw that there were these two condensations, stellar condensations. They looked like quasars, but everybody would have said that they had, had to have the same redshift as the central galaxy because they were obviously in this filament that had been ejected. What they found was that each of these objects had a much higher redshift and that the filament itself uh, had the same redshift in spectral composition as the galaxy from which it was ejected. And they got some spectra using what's called the Nordic Optical Telescope uh, in the Canary Islands on La Palma. It's not a very large telescope, uh, but they got some excellent data and they got spectra of these two faint objects, one by 7603 and one by the companion galaxy. And believe it or not, they showed that both of them were quasars. Uh, not very high redshift quasars, but, but definite quasars. chance to have uh, many quasars around a galaxy as a background object. Of course you have some chance, but these are very, very low. And uh, this is uh, what, uh, what should be answered. This is what should be answered. NGC 7603 is a, a very special case of, of this correlation. You, you find not only uh, three objects with different rests in the neighborhood of, 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 of a major safer galaxy. You, you also find the filament connecting all of them. So this is more important because the, the probability to have all the, these objects, not only in the neighborhood, but exactly in the filament, is, is extremely low. The galaxy, which is an active galaxy, two low redshift quasars, and another galaxy with twice the redshift. So in other words, you had four objects all connected together, apparently, by a luminosity, by a luminous bridge, each with a different redshift. Now that, I would say, is pretty conclusive evidence for the existence of non cosmology redshifts. We were lucky because uh, we, we have found uh, that the object uh, is, uh, has more controversy than expected. If, if in the past, uh, cheap art uh, thought, uh, and Barbies and all other people that have dedicated some effort to research this, this object, if they thought that there were two objects connected by a filament, with uh, different recipe. Now we have discovered that there are four objects 
all connected by the same filament and all of them with very different residues. So the, the Doppler residue is discarded. I think they have to look at it and I think it's one of the most striking results that we have available. They, how they can make sense of it other than saying that these objects, that these redshifts of connected objects that are, that are the same, more or less the same distance from us, that these redshifts um, are, are, have non-cosmological components to them. The topic of the anomaly of redshift is very important for most of the areas related with cosmology and extragalactic astronomy nowadays. Uh, if we assume, as it is uh, done nowadays, that the, all the recif uh, are uh, pointing the distance of the galaxy or the quasar or whatever, uh, of course the, the results will be very different uh, uh, than assuming the other thing, that the, the recif are due to other reasons. The, the, the distance of the quasars and the galaxies will be different, uh, the energies involved in, in the process will be very different, so the, a lot of astrophysical processes uh, will have to, to, uh, to change. Conclusive evidence that uh, the expanding universe was not correct and that the redshift distance law was not correct and that we had to have some way of creating new galaxies with, with, uh, with high redshifts. It is uh, normally argued that uh, the Big Bang, for instance, the Big Bang cosmology, uh, is uh, against uh, the anomalous recipe question. And of course, the, uh, the Big Bang theory is the, the most important theory that we have nowadays to explain all that we know about cosmology, which is not too much, in my opinion. There's a large body of work going on, observational work, theoretical work, which is based on the assumption that quasars are their cosmological distances. If it turns out seriously that we're right, and all that work is in vain. We don't know anything like as much as we think we do by saying that, that the quasars are far away. And that's another huge problem for people to face up to. One of the frightening things I think for uh, conventional astronomers is to accept the fact or to realize that these intrinsic redshifts of the quasars and peculiar galaxies and so on, active galaxies, means that a lot of the things which we thought were out of great distance in the universe are very, are very much closer in. And in fact, you would have to say that what we call the local supercluster is much more crowded and contains many more objects than we previously thought. And then the question comes up, well, what is out beyond the local supercluster and can we can we, with any certainty, identify any objects that are out there? Be yeah, aware of what uh, of our interpretation, because it, we cannot distinguish which objects have, uh, have a cosmological recif and which objects have non-cosmological recif. Then uh, we cannot trust the the recif indicator as a distance indicator. People who work on on um, on the origin of the universe. They ought to look at, at, at data of this sort because they've, they've got to understand this. And uh, I've heard uh, good friend astronomers say, well, there's, there's more out there in the universe than we understand. What's really happening in these systems is that the centers of the galaxies are the places where creation is taking place rather than just in a big bang. And so you were looking at all these mini bangs where matter and energy are actually literally being created. And this is an old idea, which is not ours. Originally it was due to the very famous um, Armenian astronomer, Viktor Ambatsumian, who only died a few years ago, who also argued that galaxies, which appear to be coming apart and objects that are coming out of them are coming out of them. Very simple idea, but and Ratsumayan, who is a very well-known theorist, always said you must look at the observations and maybe if things are coming apart, appear to be coming apart, maybe they are coming apart. Conventional astronomers don't allow things to come apart. They always say there's enough dark matter in the, in the system to hold it together. But I've come to the conclusion that what it is that will unseat an established uh, prejudice, a strongly established prejudice, 
is one observation. One single observation, a usually a very simple one. The conclusion was very, very strong, just from looking at this picture, that these objects had been ejected from the central galaxy and that they were initially at high redshift and the redshift decayed as time went on. And therefore we were looking at a physics that was operating in the universe in which matter was born with low mass and a very uh, high redshift. And as it matured and evolved into our present form that we were seeing the birth and evolution of, of galaxies in the universe. If protoquasars ejected from the nucleus of active galaxies themselves evolve into new, younger galaxies, astrophysicists must find experimentally and observationally the mechanisms which describe this phenomena. One model explains that the protoquasars are ejected, trapped in the galaxy's extreme magnetic field aligned along the spiral arms, thus explaining the torn, disturbed features often observed in the galactic medium, and the frequent appearance of high redshift companion galaxies attached by filaments to a lower redshift parent galaxy. The other and most frequently observed alignment is when quasars appear to have been directly ejected out of the galaxy's active nucleus along its line of least resistance creating a field of systematically high to low redshift quasars, or younger to older evolved proto-galaxies. This is exemplified in innumerable systems like the one around the galaxy quasar field of NGC 3516. If one disregards the proposed redshift distance to these objects, observation clearly points to ejection as a likely explanation for their close vicinity to the central galaxies around which they are found. These results, though preliminary, are promising developments which may lead the way to new and exciting insights in cosmology. One of the best and earliest of the really controversial things was a Seafoot galaxy known as NGC 4319, which Chip Arp discovered that it has a protrusion coming out in the south direction from it, one of its spiral arms and ending up on another galaxy known as Macarian and people have tried to explain it away in all, all kinds of ways and, and try to take false pictures to, to show that it's not there. <laughs> But I've seen the good pictures, which were the first good, really good pictures, were taken by Jack Salentic. NGC 4319 um, was part of some work that I did in the early 80s when I was a young astronomer, a young faculty member, and um, people were coming up to me and saying, oh, I've written a paper to show that what Chip Arp has done is wrong. There were at least three famous papers right around 79, 80, 81, and it took about five minutes to look at these papers to see that they, they were flawed. And one of them was a paper that claimed to show no connection between uh, NGC 4319 and the quasar, Markarian 205. Uh, so at that time I had the opportunity to work at JPL using the new image processing facilities that had been developed for the Voyager program, in fact. And it took one hour's effort to show that there was some kind of a luminous feature between those two objects. I don't know what it is, but there's no question that there is a luminous feature, and it cannot be dismissed in the ways that it was dismissed in the early 80s. Uh, suddenly there appeared um, press releases from the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, which uh, was the uh, research arm of NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, uh, this press release said that they were not connected and it gave a, a, a Hubble Space Telescope picture. It was not very deep and you could just see two objects and no connection between them. And in this press release then they, they said that, uh, that this proved that there was no uh, contradiction with the current expanding universe paradigm. No connection between the two objects. So I looked at their picture, then I downloaded it 
and it took me five minutes to show that it's still there. Now, I don't know what it is, but I think you face up to the existence of the feature and then you consider conventional and unconventional explanations. But I was really surprised that they felt it necessary to issue a press release saying, it's not there, it's not real. It's the same thing we saw 20 years ago. But it's hard to get people to look at this because they don't understand it. You see, it's, it's again the non-cosmological redshifts. That, uh, that the people who had uh, been processing the pictures and released it had, must have known that the bridge was there, and yet they uh, chose to uh, try to convince the public that, uh, that in fact, uh, it wasn't there and that everything was right with the current uh, uh, expanding universe paradigm. It's a strange attitude. I, I don't understand it as a scientist, really. I think it, that news release could have generated much more interest in astronomy than many of the more conventional news releases, because people would be talking amongst themselves, gee, what could that be? And then various people could offer scientific explanations. But to just sort of close the door, in a way, you could argue that Chip, or someone like Chip, who believes in an alternate interpretation, I'm sitting in the middle of the bridge, so it could be either way, um, he should feel strong, because I interpret that as a manifestation of fear and uncertainty. Because if I really had confidence in my paradigm, I'd put it right out there and say, well, yes, there is a bridge there, but this is it's either this explanation or it's that explanation, but certainly it's not what your art says. But instead to just say it isn't there, that's a manifestation of fear, I think. This uh, misrepresentation of the results on a public level, published through a press release from a, a government-supported uh, institution, which was not refereed and which uh, gave the wrong information, seemed to escalate in my opinion and uh, my colleagues' opinion, the, the escalate the controversy into a, uh, a publicity campaign, which was sort of like doing scientific research by press releases uh, in an attempt to uh, uh, defend as a sort of a last resort a, a, a dying paradigm in, in physics. I don't know what more one can do than the data are there, they've been got, we have to make sense of it. I think in one sense they they think it's bad to quote confuse unquote the public because if you believe in the standard paradigm with all your heart you know it can't be real. I know it can't be real. You know, if, if I try to be at all rational within the context of the current Big Bang ideology So if you have a cosmological theory that actually starts somewhere, I mean, I knew this when I was 10 years old, I think, I was sitting out in the backyard swinging with my brother, thinking about what would the edge of the universe look like if we got to the edge of the universe, and we both of us realized, even at that age, that the notion was somehow did not make sense. The universe can't have a, an edge, and it can't have a beginning. Because if it had an edge, there had to be something on the other side, right? And if there had a beginning, there had to be something on the other side of that. And somehow, cosmology, a, a, a satisfying philosophical cosmology to me, would have to start with that notion that it was always this way, and it always will be this way. There's all kinds of things happening in there, but somehow the basic laws of nature are such that this exists. Of course, uh, this is uh, astrophysics, this is science, and uh, everything uh, can be refuted. You have an explanation, uh, uh, you can produce an opposite explanation, so uh, not, not everything is not so simple.
the, the, the theoreticians ought to be really looking at this theoretical problem and the ob observers ought to be gathering much more data of the sort that we get. But I think they're all a little scared because it's an unpopular subject. Uh, they're, they're worried about their jobs and, and they're worried about getting uh, um, getting moving on up the ladder, you know, if they're, if they're postdocs. A young person uh, in academia cannot afford to go against the Big Bang. Uh, he'd immediately mm -hmm. lose, lose his position, mm -hmm. um, tenure. <laughs> Tenure, tenure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I said last night. And so there is this difficulty. You can't expect them to do that. Don't collaborate with, uh, with Chip Arp or don't collaborate with Geoffrey because if you, if you do that, you will have problems to get a position in such a place. I, I, I received some, such a black mail. When I was a student, I was naive. And when, when I saw the chance to, to work with Chip Arp, he sent me a letter. This is 30 years ago and uh, warning me now that you may find some people put off by an association with me. And I, I didn't, really, I didn't even understand what he was talking about. I thought, I'm just trying, you know, we're just looking for the truth, aren't we? That you don't get promoted, you don't get recognition by looking too much into unpopular areas. Cosmology is, is not a science. It's, it's a, has a lot of scientific aspects. We, we can know many things with the science. We can know how the galaxies are distributed, what is our measure with the, with the observations. We can know uh, how, is, how rich are the, the metal, how many metals are in the intergalactic medium or in some galaxy. And, and all these aspects are scientific. But uh, uh, with regard to some considerations uh, uh, about the beginning of the universe, this is a some way uh, crossing the barrier of the science and uh, going to the to something in between the science and metaphysical speculation. In my opinion. Sociology is very important in science. People are in groups and gangs and cliques and clusters, and of course that enforces conformity. You want to be one of the boys. Now we're entering the realm of cosmology, and it is here that religion, philosophy, metaphysics, and science all meet. And make no mistake about it, they all play a role in, in, our, in our beliefs. The, the amount of data that we actually have to support any particular model is, is small. So you, you tend to think alike. The longer you're together, the more you will think alike. I remember one famous group once, um, I asked them, how do you resolve uh, disagreements amongst yourselves? And the reply was, we vote. And I thought, what a strange thing to do in science. Vote? I would think the best thing is that all seven of you disagree. But there's a feeling that that creates chaos. Some claim that most questions in nature have been answered. Others think that we have only just begun asking. This is their story, the story of the universe. Plasmas are found virtually everywhere. Uh, they're found in solid state matters at very low temperatures. There, a, a flame of a match, a fluorescent light is, is a plasma. Fire in your fireplace is a plasma. The aurora obviously is a plasma. The sun and all of the stars are a uh, plasma. Lightning is a plasma. Uh, in fact, 99.999%, as Alphane used to say, of all observable matter in the universe is matter in the plasma state. A plasma is an ionized gas. It means a gas consisting of charged particles rather than neutral particles, uh, which uh, is the constituents of a, of a normal gas. Uh, the charged particles are electrons and 
uh, atoms that uh, lack electrons. So it consists of negative and positive particles that interact with each other by means of electric and magnetic fields. Uh, the term uh, plasma, as applied to electromagnetics, uh, was first coined in 1923 by the Nobel laureate Irving Langmuir to describe the uh, experiments that uh, he was doing at the time. Uh, basically, plasma uh, consists of charged particles, the electrons and the ions or protons that, uh, that we know in nature. It can also include uh, charged dust. And in Irving Langmuir's experiments with the charged particles, he noted that they acted almost in a lifelike manner. They tended to develop cells. They, they acted very much uh, in, in a way that uh, in, indicated that the, they might somehow be uh, related to, to life. And for that reason, he borrowed the term uh, plasma from the, uh, from the blood plasma. A plasma is like a um, society of individuals where the, in, all the individuals are interacting with each other through complex interaction, interactions like media, newspapers, television, and so on. Uh, and the normal gas is, is like uh, a society where the individuals simply basically don't interact or interact at very short distances, very local communities. The first effort to understand how plasma functions in the universe, to understand the plasma universe, was Christian Berkelund, who at the end of the 19th century wanted to understand what is the nature of the aurora. At this time, people were studying, uh, for the first time, the nature of electrons. And you had, for example, the development of the cathode ray tube. The cathode ray tube we're familiar with. This is what powers our computers and our television screens. You have electrons accelerated, smashing into phosphorescent atoms in the screen and producing light. Berkland reasoned that this might be exactly what's happening with the aurora. He basically felt that electrons coming from the sun would be channeled by the Earth's magnetic field into the atmosphere, where they would hit the atoms in the atmosphere, creating the fluorescent glow of the aurora. He wasn't content with just looking at this theoretically. He wanted to look at it experimentally as well. So he built a, a scale model of the Earth as a magnet, which he called a Torella, which was a, a, a metal sphere with a magnet inside. And he put it in a vacuum chamber, and he basically modeled the system of the aurora in the Earth's magnetic field. way of thinking was uh, in direct opposition to what I would call uh, over -special specialization in, in science. He, he was doing a lot of different things, uh, taking patents, uh, his, he was thinking about cosmology and about small practical things, he was creating industries uh, and, and so on. And I think the main power in, in his ideas uh, when it comes to, to uh, inspiration is uh, in, in particular uh, this.
his death, this whole approach of seeing uh, the universe, as Berkman put it, as filled with all sorts of charged electrical particles, basically fell away. He didn't have uh, descendants, uh, intellectual descendants, who would pursue this, this uh, avenue of, of approach. Chapman's approach, which is similar to that of many of the Big Bang theorists today, was to take a purely mathematical approach and say, what is the simplest way to express phenomena mathematically? And basically, let's try and fit those, the phenomena into that simplest mathematical expression. Well, he found that it was very difficult to precisely define the sort of mathematical three-dimensional currents that Berkelin had uh, hypothesized. Remember, this is long before the development of computers. So he found that the easiest mathematical representation was if the currents were all confined to a sphere that, was, that extended little beyond the Earth's atmosphere. And therefore, he started to model things on this model which completely contradicted the idea that these currents flowed from the sun and were trapped in the three-dimensional uh, structure of the Earth's magnetic field. Hannes Alvén simply felt very much uh, in, in spirit with uh, Birkeland in, 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 in this respect. Hannes Alvén was an engineer from the start and he liked to think about everything as an, as an engineer and not in very abstract uh, terms. And he realized that it would be impossible for electrons alone to flow from the sun to the earth. It had to be plasma flowing, because if the sun gave out a flow of, electrical part of electrons, eventually it would become positively charged, and that would prevent the flow from continuing. So his theory was that there were were ejections of plasma from the sun. When these blobs of plasma hit the Earth's magnetic field, they would distort it. And if the distortion was enough, you would have things called magnetic storms. It took many years before um, Alvain's work in, in this area was uh, recognized. And the main reason is that his work was so simple and so obvious that even the, uh, the brightest people did not really realize uh, the, the impact, what he was doing. He also developed at, that, at this time a more elaborated theory of how the electric currents concentrate themselves. Because, of course, when you look at the aurora, it isn't just a continuous glow. It's this fine sheet of filaments. And these filaments, Alfame knew, occurred because of what's called the pinch effect, which is if you have currents flowing through a plasma, any plasma, the currents produce magnetic fields. The magnetic fields interact with the currents in such a way the currents are attracted to each other. So if you start out with a even distribution of current, the current will filament, it will become tiny concentrated filaments of current pulled together by their own magnetic field. The, the essence of, of magnetohydrodynamics is to boil down the, the very complicated motions of plasma particles in magnetic fields into a simple model that visualizes the, the plasma as a fluid that is electrically conducting. So it, it simply is a, a fluid where currents are allowed to flow and the currents are interacting with the electric and magnetic fields and dragging the fluid with it. Another way to see it is that the fluid is dragging the magnetic fields with it. And this, this simple picture, the simple picture to visualize things had an enormous impact on how we could understand uh, phenomena in space. So he developed this pretty elaborated theory, which was compared with both laboratory experiments and observations of how the aurora works. But Chapman was still the dominant theorist 
and Chapman completely rejected his theories, and in fact wouldn't even discuss it. Thomas Alfane is generally credited as being the father of modern plasma physics, and he was of course awarded the Nobel Prize in 1970 for his extremely varied work in plasma physics. By the time that satellites and space probes had begun to demonstrate that Alfane and Faltomers and his colleagues' ideas about currents flowing through the solar system were correct, that such currents really did exist, and people began to accept that these currents, much stronger currents during the early days of the solar system, actually had a role in the formation of the solar system in compressing gas and dust down to form both the sun and the planets. By that time, Alfane had started to move on to larger scales. Alfane was uh, very eager uh, on formulating very bold theories for, for uh, uh, cosmology and uh, uh, basically rejected the, uh, the Big Bang model. And in this way, uh, came very much in, in opposition to, to the, uh, the mainstream of uh, cosmology. Because he reasoned that if these currents flowing through the solar system could have formed the stars and the planets, then could not have much larger scale currents also be the way that galaxies themselves form. Some people have said that science is a wet method for asking questions of nature. And if that's true, then we can say the Big Bang supporters are people who won't take no for an answer. Over the last two or three decades, the Big Bang theory has become increasingly more and more speculative. One expects from a scientific theory definite predictions which can be tested by observations. If the observations disprove the prediction, that theory is supposed to be uh, disproved and uh, it should be modified or abandoned. In science, we work from observation, from empirical observation that starts in the here and now and works outwards and backwards. The Big Bang starts from mathematical formulas, deductions that start from the beginning of the universe and to try and predict it forward. This is the same mathematical approach, mathematical deductive approach that led 2,000 years ago to the development of the Ptolemaic universe. The universe, of course, which was Earth-centered with the planets going around the Earth of the stars in a crystalline sphere. What these theories have in common is that they try and derive what should be the universe based on what perfect principles we can develop, what God should have made the universe to look like, and then they try to fit the universe into that perfect uh, framework. However, what has happened over the years is that whenever observations have come up which don't agree with the predictions of uh, the Big Bang theory, the theory adds an extra assumption which is not at all tested, which is not at all resting on conventional physics and simply assumes that that must be true. The problem of that is that develops myth, not science. It develops a religious faith in which nothing in the real world, in the observable world, can contradict the faith in 
this structure in the Big Bang. This undermines the entire scientific enterprise. The reason science has been valuable to human beings is because it allows us to predict nature in such a way as we can use nature in a predictable fashion and technology. To abandon this approach, which has served us so well, and to go to the idea that we can deduce, uh, we can read the mind of God, as Stephen Hawking says, and deduce from perfect mathematical principles what the universe must be, is to abandon the scientific method. This idea of the Big Bang, which did originate at the beginning of the 20th century, the reason why it is so widespread nowadays is that it has a deep connection with the biblical creation. Uh, instead of saying that the universe was created by God like 4,000 or 6,000 years ago, they now say it was created 10 billion years or 20 billion years. So for most people and also for many scientists, they see a connection between these creation which comes from the Bible and uh, this scientific point of view. In 1952, in August 1952, we had a meeting of the International Astronomical Union in Rome. And we were received by the Pope. The Pope was then Pius XII. And Pius XII made an address to the astronaut, astronomers. And this address was very clear. He said, oh, the Big Bang is the Fiat Lux, and how beautiful is the astronomy, how it proves that the greatness of etc., etc., etc. And I've been always sort of an heretic in all that sort of things. I don't believe in any god. And having the Fiat Lux and the Big Bang associated each with the other made me suspicious from the very beginning. Nowadays, the majority of the physicists and astronomers, they believe and they work with the point of view of the Big Bang, according to which the whole universe did uh, originate out of nothing, like 10 or 20 billion years ago, in a fiat lux, in a moment of creation. There was nothing before, and then the whole universe did uh, appear and then begin to expand and to grow and our galaxy, our life came out of this great explosion in the past. But I myself, have, I had always problems with this point of view because they are somewhat against the principles of physics, the most basic principles of physics which are related with the conservation of matter and conservation of energy. Yeah, I forgot completely about the Big Bang because it just didn't interest me to look in those distant things of which the physics was rather vague and uh, difficult to observe. But let's face it, in all the story of astronomy for years and years and centuries and centuries, the progress came from new observations and from confrontation of those new observations with past theories, contradictions, sometimes no contradiction, sometimes just a confirmation, but most often the contradictions led to new progress, to change in the theories. In standard Big Bang cosmology, you have what I call a series of epicycles. The Greeks used to have epicycles, uh, which are uh, known as circles whose centers move on other circles, whose centers move on other circles, in order that they could correctly describe the position of a planet at any given time. They found that in some cases they had to introduce many circles before they could get any, anywhere near the reality. These epicycles are the assumptions that have been put in ad hoc into the theory from time to time. The way that uh, the Big Bang has handled the cosmic microwave background is a very good example of how this process works. When the cosmic microwave background was discovered in 1964, this very smooth, even radio radiation coming from all directions at once 
the smoothness of the microwave background was considered a proof of the existence of the Big Bang. Only a universal explosion, they argue, could create this smooth, even background. Now, this is not necessarily so. Actually, uh, the Schrodinger radiation, to me, has not a cosmological value. It is observed in any cosmology. In any cosmology, you can predict the Schrodinger radiation. So it's a proof of no cosmology at all if it can be predicted by all of them. There's no explanation at all of the microwave background in the, in the Big Bang Theory. It, it, all you can say for the theory is that it permits you to put it in if you want to put it in. So you look and it's there, so you put it in. That, that's that, it isn't an explanation. First of all, the temperature of the uh, microwave background, basically the amount of energy was not what the Big Bang uh, supporters had predicted. They had predicted a much higher temperature. So it was 50 degrees Kelvin that was being compared against the 2 to 5 degrees Kelvin from the, from the steady state uh, universe. Now, this may not sound like much, but in energy density, where we measure the absolute differences, the differences is four orders of magnitude. 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 difference. So there is an enormous difference between 50 degrees Kelvin, a rather poor indicator of what is happening in the universe, and 3 degrees Kelvin. When you read the textbooks, they don't tell the whole story. They don't present these figures, 5 greater than 5, 7, 50, and then that they did find 3. So that's very strange how the the textbooks, they, they hide a part of history. And the temperature uh, of the Big Bang uh, proponents was rapidly readjusted from 50 degrees to 3 degrees. But their theory could be adjusted so that the temperature becomes a free variable. You just take them as what was observed. We have an observable universe which is made of stars, galaxies that are not very distant, and, and that's all, because the 3 degree radiation, I would even think that it might be local. Still not. And going beyond that is, I think, a wild extrapolation, whatever it is, and the physics that we could imagine to be existing there is based on nothing, because we have nothing no test for it. Although Big Bang advocates claim the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation as conclusive proof of their theory, history actually shows that there is a long line of well-hidden predictions previous to those made by Big Bang theorists. Not only were these predictions prior to those of Gamow and associates, but more importantly, they were made without any need for an expanding universe and with far greater precision. This shows us that observations such as the background temperature of space have no preference for one or another theory and therefore may not be used as definitive proof of any particular model. The fact that a theory is able to describe an observation does not mean that the observation proves the theory. This is Bob Wilson at Bell Laboratories. The noise you're listening to is noise from a radio astronomy receiver on the 20-foot horn reflector antenna. This is the original instrument with which Arno Penzias and I discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1965. This radiation comes from all directions and has a thermal spectrum. It sounds, therefore, very much like the noise you would hear on an FM set or a TV set which is tuned to an unused channel. Unfortunately, only about 10% of the noise you hear is coming from the cosmic microwave background radiation. The instrument is contributing about 22 degrees of noise. The Earth's atmosphere is contributing another 4 degrees. Our Milky Way galaxy is contributing 1, and finally the cosmic microwave background radiation, another 3 degrees. 
when you say that the microwave background is a perfect black body radiation, that means it is completely thermalized. The theory of black body radiation tells you that that is the ultimate state of radiation when all information of sources from where radiation came uh, has disappeared because thermalization means that it's completely smoothed out, wiped out uh, its sources. One of the main things that people point to as confirmation of the Big Bang as a valid theory is its predictions of abundance of the light elements. This confirms that the theory is a good theory. But in fact, it doesn't. In fact, observations clearly contradict this prediction of the Big Bang. Big Bang predicts the abundance of three elements, helium, lithium, and the isotope deuterium, which is the heavy isotope of ordinary hydrogen. Now, one of the uh, conclusions from this particular hypothesis that you can make deuterium in the Big Bang was that the density of matter in the universe should not exceed a certain value. Now, over the years, uh, in the 1960s, this seemed to be holding out. 1970s, it seemed to be holding out. But by 1980s, it had become clear that the universe has considerable amount of dark matter, which is not uh, included in these calculations. Now, if you include all this dark matter, you exceed the limit that deuterium abundance has put. That means if you assume that all the dark matter is present, then you could not have made deuterium in the amount that is observed in the universe. So this was a way of saying that the Big Bang prediction was wrong. To determine the density of the universe and, com and see whether this is consistent. If the theory is right, the density of the universe determined from deuterium abundance, the one determined from lithium abundance, and the one determined from helium should all be the same number. There can only be one density of the universe. Well, actually, that's not true. Again, these are gross contradictions. And yet again, it doesn't cause the abandonment of the theory. Big Bang theorists simply say, well, there must be something that we don't understand about the evolution of lithium, about the evolution of deuterium. And even though these predictions have steadily diverged over the course of time, but what did the Big Bang proponents do? They wanted a way out, so they said that this extra matter, which is proving to be awkward to fit into the framework, has to be a strange kind of matter, which is often called non-baryonic matter. Non-baryonic matter is basically matter which is not made of protons, neutrons, and the kind of uh, elements that we are made of here on the Earth, or which we see in the stars or in the interstellar medium. Dark matter. What was dark matter? Dark matter was some matter that we don't understand. We don't know what it's about. We haven't observed it. But it isn't ordinary matter, so it doesn't enter into our equations about the light elements, and we can't see it as stars. But dark matter is 90 or 99 percent of the mass of the universe. This is what we call in science a fudge factor. When your equations don't uh, work out, you just write in this little plus something. Well, in this case, this was a humongous fudge factor because it was 90 or 99% of the universe. And you have to not only postulate that this matter has to exist, but it has to exist in quantities much greater than the amount you see of ordinary matter. And I should emphasize that people have looked for dark matter. People have looked for dark matter since it was proposed 20 years ago. Axions, wimps, little particles that are supposed to be floating around in space that we should, in theory, be able to observe as they pass through the Earth. Dozens of experiments have looked for these particles. Not one has been found. Again, this should be a contradiction 
the way science works, you make a prediction, observation contradicts it, the theory should be re rejected. But that hasn't happened. And the epicycles don't end. There's a problem with dark matter, even theoretically, even though we can't observe it, there's still a problem with it, which is dark matter slows down the expansion of the universe. So the length of time that the universe has existed, the length of time since the Big Bang, should be shorter than what's indicated just by linear expansion. But the problem is, it's too short. The prediction of the cold dark matter theory is that the universe should be about 8 billion years old. Well, that's a big problem. We can determine the age of stars in our own galaxy, in the oldest globular clusters, both based on very well confirmed theories of the nuclear evolution of stars and spectroscopic observation. And the stars in our galaxy are 13 or 14 billion years old. So it's very embarrassing to have 14 billion year old stars in an 8 billion year old universe. In addition, they went into dark energy. Now, why did dark energy come in? Because if you take the present value of the cosmological constant and the cosmological constant which came out of inflation, you find that they are not the same. Not only they are the same, but you have to find that the difference lies in something like 108 orders of magnitude. Now, can you imagine a physical theory getting the answers wrong by a factor 10 to the power 108. Yet the Big Bang cosmologists very coolly accept this and simply put in another epicycle by saying that there is a dark energy which has changed over the time by this factor. So we have to accept that. Dark energy is some force, again, unknown on Earth, unpredicted by any theory that we have validation of here on Earth that causes an acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So as the universe is accelerating, and it's older than appears on the basis of the dark matter theory, and it's 15 billion years old. So we solve the, the uh, problem of the age of the universe by hypothesizing that yet a third completely ad hoc epicycle of dark energy. So now we have a universe which is 70% dark energy, 28% dark matter, and only 2% matter that we can observe through our telescopes and here on Earth. Epicycle is being piled onto epicycle. And in the process, the, what we call the predictive power of the theory is fading away to nothing. One of the most destructive features of the methodology of the Big Bang is that it conveys the idea that only experts can understand the universe. Only people versed in extremely complicated mathematics can understand the universe. That if dark matter, dark energy, uh, appear to be incomprehensible or even nonsensical, it's because you don't understand the mathematics of uh, these complex equations. This is, of course, the argument of the emperor's new clothes. If you can't see the emperor's new clothes, then you must be either stupid or incompetent. So this goes on, and we can find that uh, the uh, old Greek tradition of epicycles, which was even adopted by Copernicus, and <coughs> uh, has been continuing in uh, standard Big Bang cosmology. If we go by the history, the uh, Keplerian orbits, which were elliptical orbits, very uh, cleanly and neatly resolved the uh, problem of planets. And the circles upon circles idea had ultimately to crumble down. Now, in the same way, uh, I suspect that the Big Bang theory will collapse under its own weight of assumptions, and a more neat theory, neat interpretation of the universe will emerge. Thank you.
Does this mean that the age of the universe is not what Big Bang theorists have implied? Could the universe be eternal after all? How much are cosmologists really able to know? We are now in, in a stage uh, which can be called a, a plasma universe. And we are simply not privileged to know what stage the plasma universe evolved from. We do not have privilege to that information. We don't, we do not know, we will never know. And this is one major difference between the plasma universe cosmology and the Big Bang cosmology that claims to be uh, closing in on the uh, final answer. The universe described by plasma cosmology is quite different. Here we are talking about a universe with no beginning and no end, an infinite universe continuously evolving an evolution that is continuously increasing at an ever-rapid pace. It is a universe in which there is a coherence between what we can un understand in the here and now on Earth and what we can understand in the rest of the universe. A universe in which there is no real limit to our ability to understand more new phenomena. And a universe in which we can apply what we learn in the universe in present day technology. The basic difference between plasma and all other forms of matter, that is solid liquids and gases, is that a plasma produces electromagnetic radiation and also tends to filament. So that we would expect in, in a simulation, which is what we see, in an experiment, which is what we see, we would expect to see throughout the cosmos a filamentary structure that is a spaghetti of currents intertwining the cosmos. We can use plasma theory derived from experiments in the laboratory, from the basic concepts of plasma instabilities, from Maxwell's equations, and from the law, well-known laws of gravitation to describe and predict how the structure of the universe came into being and what that structure is. So the key question is, how could this structure come into existence? Now, in the Big Bang Theory, the universe starts out in extremely homogeneous, very smooth. This is, was in direct contradiction to the plasma universe that insisted that the universe overall must be filamentary. But what we have today is extremely clumpy matter. And when I talk about these huge voids, the structure of voids, the matter inside the, the voids is less than 10%, perhaps less than a few percent as dense as the average and the matter in the walls of these voids where these filaments of superclusters of galaxies are located is 10 or 20 times the average. So you have extreme clumpiness. Now, what's the problem for the Big Bang to explain this? There's a huge problem. There is not enough time since the Big Bang to form these structures. These structures are older much older than the time hypothesized since the Big Bang. Now, again, uh, in interpreting the observational information, uh, we can again go to the uh, laboratory, which we are privileged to, uh, to diagnose in any number of ways, in any number of directions, and run any number of experiments, which you can't do with the universe. Uh, but we also turn to the uh, supercomputer uh, simulations. Now, what a simulation does is that it allows you to model the plasma regardless of size, put in the uh, rather few uh, basic uh, initial equations, and then, and then follow the simulation through its various nonlinear stages uh, and the different morphologies or, or shapes that the uh, plasma will take. In 
uh, Tony Peratt simulations, as the current spirals into the center of the galaxy, turns around and moves out along the axis of the galaxy. In that central area where the current is extremely concentrated, there seemed again the potential for violent events. And Alfane and, and uh, Peratt raised the question, couldn't this be a way of explaining the extremely violent events that occur in the center of galaxies that are known as quasars, in which huge amounts of energy are released in what, by astronomical terms, is a relatively small amount of time. That is, millions of years compared with the billions of years galaxies exist. Initially, the time frames shown uh, represent a billion years or so, but now we're going to, going to carry it out for 10 billion years to see what happens to these uh, double radio galaxies or quasars as the uh, two filaments have evolved into. And you'll see that the tails start to elongate and uh, fairly soon you're going to start to see a uh, spiral structure. And uh, as we get closer to the 10 billion years, the end of the uh, movie, uh, you will see that we have formed the uh, shape, the morphology, the shape of a spiral galaxy. Now, Alfane developed a number of concepts that were critical to the, to the whole uh, understanding of the plasma universe. First of all was the basic concept of scale and variance in plasmas. That means there are certain phenomena in plasmas that don't change regardless of whether you're dealing with a laboratory scale of centimeters or a solar system scale of millions of kilometers or a galactic scale of hundreds of thousands of light years. What that meant was that time scales the same way as distance does. So not only does this mean that the, that the phenomena of the, uh, of the uh, cosmos can be studied in the laboratory, but because of time compression, Phenomena of the cosmos are essentially transient phenomena. This is, it's funny to think of a galaxy lasting billions of years as a transient phenomenon, but it's, it's, it's analogous to events in a laboratory that last only millions of se seconds. Another way of putting it, the plasma universe is extremely dynamic. It's not going to be hypothesis. We've, we've moved further than hypothesis We've definitely gone into, into the second lake, the analysis, and we're well towards the third lake. Now, we haven't reached the third lake, of course, and, and perhaps, well, you can't with the universe because you can't experiment with the universe itself. Now, of course, we, like Alphane, uh, his idea, indeed, you can determine what's happening in the universe in, in, in an experiment, but as far as producing universes, well, we're, we're not gonna do that. So, so we're going to do the best we can in the laboratory. The universe that the Big Bang envisions and the universe of plasma cosmology are very different universes and they have very different implications and they cohere with very different ideologies of what is happening here on Earth. The Big Bang theory will collapse under its own weight of assumptions and a more neat theory, neat interpretation of the universe will emerge.